Hello and welcome to Insight Ophthalmology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to another lecture in Diabetic Retinopathy series. Today we are studying the laser treatment in Diabetic Retinopathy. So what is laser? Laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Now there are two types of laser treatments that are used in Diabetic Retinopathy. One diffuse type of laser treatment which is referred to as the panretinal photocoagulation and sometimes it is also known as the scatter photocoagulation. And this type of laser treatment is basically used for proliferative diabetic retinopathy. The second type of laser which is more of a focal laser or a limited laser limited to the macula is the macula laser which is used for diabetic macular edema. So what is the principle of applying laser to retina in case of diabetic retinopathy? The principle on which the laser is working in diabetic retinopathy is the photocoagulation. As the name suggests, photo means light and coagulation means denaturation of the proteins. So what happens is when the laser is applied to the retina, the temperature which the laser will produce is about 50 to 100 degrees centigrade and this high heated temperature and uh, the laser will be actually absorbed by the various chromophores or the pigments which are present inside the retina. Now usually these pigments are melanin, xanthophyll and all these pigments are going to absorb specific wavelengths according to their uh, pigmentation and according to the specific uh, wavelength for which they are designed. Right. So the melanin basically which is present in the RPE, retinal pigmented epithelium, will absorb this laser light and will lead to a lot of heat production. And because of that heat production, the temperature of the uh, retina is going to rise. And at high temperature, what happens is the strong bonds which are present in between the cells are going to actually break off and as the cells are going to get separated. Moreover, all the proteins which are present, the cytoplasm and all that is going to get denatured and coagulated and the biological activity will get lost. So this is the principle of photocoagulation, right? And this is how the laser work in diabetic retinopathy. So wantedly, we are damaging the cell in diabetic retinopathy using the laser but why are we actually doing that doing that so what is the principle of this laser therapy so basically we know that in diabetic retinopathy we have areas which do not have good retinal perfusion now i have already explained this to you in my video on perspective on diabetic retinopathy in which i am explaining the pathophysiology of diabetic retinopathy so there are areas of poor retinal perfusion and now we are going to damage these poor retinal perfusion areas directly by laser and that laser is going to produce photocoagulation. So these poor retinal perfusion areas will be now damaged. So now what will happen? The, retina, the poor areas which were uh, actually uh, uh, which were not having good perfusion as they are totally ablated this will decrease the overall retinal oxygen demand okay and the level of retinal hypoxia because the cells which were previously using the oxygen now they are totally destroyed so they are not going to require the oxygen so the overall demand of the oxygen will go down in the retina now as we know that hypoxia and increased oxygen demand will lead to increased VEGF production and increased angiogenic factors now since we have already destroyed the areas of poor retinal perfusion that means the areas which were hypoxic and we have damaged them so that now they don't need any oxygen at all for any metabolic activity because they are totally dead okay so now what will happen is there will be down regulation of androgenic factors and VEGF production also will go down and whatever viable retina is present where the perfusion is normal that retina will, uh, will actually receive increased oxygen perfusion right so this will lead to decrease in the wedge of production by the retina and uh, as the wedge of will go down new vascularization will go down and the vascular permeability will decrease and the retinal edema will also decrease so this is basically the principle of laser in which the damaged hypoxic areas are being totally damaged and now we are converting those hypoxic area into anoxic area that means we are damaging those uh, cells in such a way that they are getting coagulated the enzyme machinery is getting shut down and these cells which are now shut down metabolically they are not going to need any oxygen so they become anoxic so the remaining good retina can actually use the oxygen whichever is available in the retina so this is the principle of laser therapy in diabetic retinopathy so i hope that is clear 
Now, in this video, we are basically focusing on the diffuse type of laser, which is called the panretinal photocoagulation. Now, the panretinal photocoagulation is actually highly effective and it actually reduces the risk of severe vision loss by about 50% uh, 50, uh, at two years in patients with high risk PDR. So, it's, it, it has been proven already by the DRCR study and I've already mentioned to you about this in my previous videos. The study also showed that the argon laser was much better than the xenon arc laser. The xenon arc laser was actually causing more uh, damage. But but now uh, for at many centers, instead of argon laser, we are using this air cooled ND arc laser and these ND arc lasers are coming as pattern scanning lasers also in which instead of getting a single spot of laser, certain pattern of uh, laser spots will come either as a cube or as a curve line or as a grid, you know, different patterns will come and these patterns will actually make the job of the person who is giving the laser very easy, uh, very easy because instead of giving one shingle shot at a time, you can now give uh, a bunch of uh, shots all together in the form of a pattern. So that is called the pattern scanning lasers, also called the Pascals, and they are using the frequency double uh, NDR laser technology. So what are the indications and when do you actually go for the panretinal photocoagulation? Okay, so when is the panretinal photocoagulation done? So there are certain definite indications and there are possible indications also. The definite indications are which were given by the DRCR study. It said that the laser treatment, especially the panretinal photocoagulation is very effective in number one, in cases who are suffering with high risk proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And number two, whenever we have neovascularization of the iris or neovascularization of the angle. So basically, uh, you can remember that whenever you have neovascularization broadly, okay, we can go for panretinal photocoagulation, whether it is neovascularization of the disc, neovascularization elsewhere, neovascularization of the iris or neovascularization of the angle also. And here I'm talking about the angle of the anterior chamber. Now, in some cases, there are certain possible indications like when very severe P NPDR also, non-proliferated diabetic retinopathy, in which the person is having two out of the four to one rule. So, in my previous video on classification of diabetic retinopathy, I told you what is meant by the four to one rule and what is severe and very severe NPDR. So, there, uh, PRP can also be done in those people who are suffering with very severe NPDR, especially when it, it actually depends on the judgment of the uh, treating physician as well. Sometimes when you know that the patient uh, might not be able to come for the follow-up, in those cases also sometimes you prefer to give PRP and also patients coming from very uh, backward areas who might not come for regular follow-ups and, and you uh, actually uh, you actually fear the patient converting, uh, the patient might get converted from very severe NPDR to PDR soon. In those cases also, you can actually give PRP. Sometimes patients who are suffering with very severe NPDR and they already have the PDR in the other eye, then also you can uh, give such patients uh, PRP treatment. So how is the PRP given basically? How do you give this laser? So there are three types of laser delivery systems. Either you can uh, give laser to the patient using the slit lamp system. This is a slit lamp. So from the slit lamp, we're using a contact lens on the patient eye and the patient's eye, patient is being uh, and the patient is actually under local anesthesia or the topical anesthesia that is called a slit lamp system or slit lamp delivery system which is the most convenient way of giving the panretinal photocoagulation then the other type of system is the laser indirect ophthalmoscopy sometimes the view might not be so clear and you might uh, want to give laser to the peripheral areas of the retina so in those cases the laser indirect ophthalmoscope is more appropriate in which using an indirect ophthalmoscope and a laser system System which is inbuilt into that, you can deliver panretinal photocoagulation or laser to the retina. Then the third type which is usually done intraoperatively during a surgery is by using a probe like this and this probe is going to uh, be delivering the laser like this and since it is delivered during the surgery and you're actually inserting your probe inside the eye, the endoprobe and therefore it is and then delivering the laser it is called endo laser which is given intraoperatively. So these are the three delivery systems by which you will actually give the laser to the patient. 
So what are the various types of lenses which are used? The lenses that we use can be the Goldman 3 mirror. Then we have the Mainster standard, Mainster high. Uh, these are the various types of lenses. So mostly they are all, you know, very, uh, the, they are lenses which will cause image magnification. And they will also call, cause magnification of the laser spot that we actually uh, uh, deliver to the patient's retina. So uh, if you are using a Mainster standard, for example, the spot size will actually get magnified to about 1.05 times. And as you can see, these are basically the uh, lenses which will give you wide field of vision about 140 as you can see with the Goldman 3 mirror and with the mains to higher getting about 88 and with the ocular PDT and the Volks uh, area centralis you're getting 120 degrees field uh, to 133 degrees field and 70 to 84 degrees respectively. So we need a good lens which will give you a, a wider field of view so that you can uh, complete your panatinal photocoagulation uh, easily and moreover you also need some magnification which will increase the spot size which will magnify the spot size on the retina so these are the lenses which can be used for the panretinal photocoagulation so what are the parameters or the settings that you put on your machine while doing a panretinal photocoagulation now here uh, first we will just go through it and then i will give you a quick mnemonic so for the spot diameter, the laser spot diameter is usually set to about 100 to 500 micrometers. And on an average, you can remember it to be about 200 micrometers. Now the power is taken to be about 200 millijoules. And then the duration is about again 100 to 200 milliseconds. So you can remember over here the 200, 200, 200 rule. So the laser spot diameter is about 200 micrometers. The power setting is about 200 millijoules and the duration is also 200 milliseconds. And how many spots you are giving? Just add one more zero. So about 1000 to 2000 spots you are actually giving, right? And when you're giving these uh, spots about 1000 to 2000 spots, the distance between the burns or the spots will be about one half to one spot width apart. So what I mean to say is that if you're giving these laser spots like this, the distance between the two spots should be equal to fit one more spot inside it or half of the spot. So that is the distance that you need to keep between the spots. And what is the intensity? How long are you going to give it? The intensity is set to be uh, about moderate intensity burns right so they are titrated in such a way that we want a visible gray white burn in the treatment tissue right so the laser is applied and the doctor will be actually visualizing the retina till the retina turns into gray white color burn so that is called a moderate intensity so at this juncture i want to tell you what is meant by light intensity burns mild intensity burns moderate and heavy intensity burns the light intensity burns means that the burn is barely visible okay or barely visible retinal blanching so if this is blanching okay you in light intensity burns you don't get enough of retinal blanching then we have mild intensity burns in mild intensity burns you will just get a very faint white retinal blanching so in light one you are not able to tell that whether laser treatment has occurred or not in mild one you will get a very faint blanching in moderate intensity burns you will get dirty white retinal blanching so as you can see over here they're not really white in color there are certain black stains into it so this is called dirty white blanching and then in heavy intensity burns the white color will be more dense okay so that's called dense white retinal blanching so the type of blanching or the intensity of burns that we are using in panretinal photocoagulation is the ones which are inducing the gray white or dirty white retinal blanching that is moderate intensity burns so i hope that is clear so now you know what are the settings for panatinal photocoagulation what are the indication what are the lenses used okay so where are you going to deliver the laser in the retina so what is the location of doing this panretinal photocoagulation right so let us see the location first and then we'll explain it to you using a diagram so nasally as we know that we have the disc right so in the nasal part of the retina you have to give it from if you take it from the disc just leave about 500 microns distance uh, area around disc and then you start giving it nasally. That is about one third disc uh, diameter area you're going to spare nasally on the disc and the remaining part you will give, uh, you will start giving your uh, laser shots. Temporally, if you see, 
that means temporal from the disc, about 4 disc diameter area from the disc you are going to leave. That is about if you got twice the distance of fovea from the disc you are going to leave and not deliver any laser. Uh, after you cover this 4 disc diameter area which, is, uh, which, which comes to about total 6000 micrometers, then you are going to deliver the uh, laser shots. Inferiorly you will start giving it from the inferior arcade and superiorly you can start giving it from the superior arcade or at all if, if at all you want to give up to the superior arcade about one row within the superior arcade you can give. So this is the posterior boundary of the photocoagulation. Let me explain it to you with an example with a photo. So this is your retina. Okay. So you are going to start the pan retinal photocoagulation as the name suggests pan retinal photocoagulation. So you are giving it almost in the entire retina. But there are certain areas of the retina where you are not supposed to give the laser treatment. So what are those areas? So if you see nasally, the disc is present nasally, the disc, right? So you can see the 500 micrometer area here we are not going to give. So you will start it from here and keep on delivering the shots till here. And you are going to reach up to the equator as much anteriorly as you can give. The anterior limit is like uh, some people say that you have to give it up to the ora serrata. However, it is very difficult to give it, give the laser shots up to the ora serrata. So they actually say that you have to give as anterior as possible and usually up to the anterior border of the vortex ampulla, which is nothing but the equator of the uh, retina or the eyeball. So nasally you start from this 500 micrometer away from the disc, right? Temporally, if you st st consider this to be the disc and this to be the fovea, the distance between the fovea and the uh, and the disc and twice this distance is the distance from where you are going to start giving your laser shot. So this distance from the fovea, if you calculate, it comes to about 3000 micrometers. And as we know that the disc is about 1500 micrometers. So what is 3000 micrometer? It is two disc diameter, right? So if someone is asking from the disc, how much is the distance? It is about four disc diameters. And from the fovea, it is about two disc diameters from where you're going to start giving your laser shots and then go anteriorly up to the equator and if possible up to the ura serrata. Now, superiorly, you will start uh, giving it from the superior arcade. And if you if it is very severe condition, you might give one row of laser shots about uh, below the inside this arcade also. And inferiorly, you start from the inferior arcade. The vessels have to be avoided while giving the pan retinal photocoagulation. So that is the location of the anterior and posterior uh, limits of the pan retinal photocoagulation. So I hope that is clear to you. Now, panretinal photocoagulation, this, all these shots, will you give it in one go? No, this is done in actually settings, right? So if you're giving about 2000 shots, you have to give 1000 shots in one sitting and another 1000 shots in another sitting. So whenever you are giving this uh, panretinal photocoagulation shot, it's always better to uh, do it in the inferior retina first. The reason is that the patient is actually susceptible to get a vitreous hemorrhage. Now in my, in my clinical findings video and the clinical stages of diabetic retinopathy, I told you that patients who are suffering with proliferated diabetic retinopathy who are suffering with neovascularization, they have more chances of landing into vitreous hemorrhage and preretinal hemorrhage. Now once there's a vitreous hemorrhage, it, is, it becomes very difficult for the doctor to visualize the retina and to give the shots in, uh, to the retina. That means the laser shots. So if you do, if you come and the blood has a tendency to gravitate inferiorly because of the gravity, you will have the blood collection in the inferior part of the vitreous, which will obscure the view to the inferior retina. So if you complete your PRP in the first setting in the inferior retina and later if there is vitreous hemorrhage also, your inferior retina of, uh, visualization will not be impaired and you will still have the superior retina. So in the next set setting, you can give shots to the superior retina. So always if when you are doing settings for panretinal photocoagulation, it is the inferior one which you should cover. Okay. And uh, and then suppose you want to give the second and third setting, then you can go nasally, nasal superior and then the temporal superior quadrant. 
Now, after you have done this panatal photocoagulation, which was actually done in local anesthesia, patient was sitting on the slit lamp and you were delivering the laser uh, treatment using a contact lens, right? So, is there any treatment that you give to the patient after panatal photocoagulation? Yes, because you are putting laser. Laser is actually causing heat inside the retina and that can cause inflammation and that can also cause pain because you are actually burning the retinal tissue and there are lots of, lots of nerves which can get stimulated over the process. So, they can be pain so you are going to give the patient topical steroids and along with steroids you will give uh, topical cycloplegics also now intraocular pressure spikes uh, can also occur intraocular pressure can rise and therefore tablet acetazolamide is also given to patients who have uh, undergone the parietal photocoagulation the position uh, that the patient is asked to sleep in is a propped up position and we usually do three follow-ups and all these follow-ups will be about four weeks apart and later three to four months follow-ups can be done after the initial three follow-ups. Now there are a lot of complications that can occur with panatal photocoagulation and that is the reason why we do not do panatal photocoagulation for everyone. We do it only when the patient is in high risk PDR or in very risk, uh, very severe NPDR, not for the mild and moderate cases. So let us see what are these complications. Number one is patient discomfort. The patient can experience pain sometimes with the panatal photocoagulation and what is happening is that we are actually causing scar tissue in the retina we are actually causing burns uh, holes in the retina so definitely we are whatever is happening with panatal photocoagulation is irreversible it cannot be reversed back sometimes uh, in some patients we might need to do multiple sessions and the panatal photocoagulation can also go on for a long time okay then you might stimulate the choroid and choroidal effusion can occur and choroidal detachment also has a possible complication intraocular pressure can rise and sometimes the existing macular edema can also increase after panatal photocoagulation because of the effusion which occurs and all that effusion is going to gravitate towards the uh, macula leading to increase in the macular edema. Now, since we are doing parietal photocoagulation in the periphery and we are ablating a lot of retina, the patient can have decreased peripheral vision. Now, also, the, they can have night vision problems and they can have color vision problems. However, night vision problems will be more common because the rods are present in the periphery and cones are present in the center. And since we are damaging the periphery more than uh, the center, we are going to have night vision problems more. Now, because if if at all the, the doctor does not focus the uh, beam of light properly, there can be burns on cornea and sometimes because of the patient factor as well. If the patient moves during the, surge, uh, during the laser treatment, there can be uh, unintentional burns on the cornea, on the iris lens and sometimes even the fovea, fovea can get damaged. And now since we are actually uh, causing laser, it can lead to inflammation in the eye. So there can be iritis, uveitis and uh, there can be accommodative difficulties because the posterior ciliary nerves, they can get damaged. And because of inflammation, there can also be sometimes synecae formation, which are additions between the lens and the iris. Now, there can be some complications which can occur quite after some time, which is called a delayed complication of photocoagulation. And they can be choroidal neovascularization. Sometimes they can be fibrosis uh, below the retina, which is called subretinal fibrosis. And they can also be a macular pucker. So that was all about the panretinal photocoagulation. Thank you and have a nice day. Kindly subscribe to the channel if you like the content.